Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to today's video on aquarium plant nutrition. I'll be covering the two main ways that aquarium plants can uptake nutrients. That's through the roots and water column. I'll also go over some different types of products that are out there like planted soil versus gravel or sand. And then I'll also go over some different companies and recommend specific products that I like. Let's get started. Planted substrate. There are so many different types of planted substrate. It can be a little overwhelming trying to decide which one's best for you. Some people are super opinionated when it comes to brands. They'll tell you, yeah, you have to get ADA. It's the best brand. But I don't really think that brand matters that much. I think what's more important is that you find the right type of product. And what I mean by that is going with an aquarium planted substrate that's, you know, designed for aquariums rather than going outside and digging up some dirt. Benefits of using aquarium soil over actual soil is that aquarium soil is far less dirty. You know, actual soil from outside, even when you cap it with sand, tends to kick up every time you stick plants in there or add water or fish dig around. Uh, not to mention that planted aquarium substrate provides a really good home for beneficial bacteria. It also promotes root growth, and is just overall a far better product. Now that being said, when I was a kid, uh, we didn't have all these planted aquarium products and when I wanted to grow plants, I would just throw soil or peat moss and then cap it with sand and that did the job. Granted, my tanks back then looked nothing like they do now. Lastly, I'd say stay away from gravel. Gravel is just a bunch of little rocks and uh, even though your plants can grow in them, they're not really gonna grow on them well. As far as brands go, I usually buy whatever's on sale. You know, if I were rich or sponsored, that might be different, but I'm not. So, uh, you know, recently there was some Fluval Stratum at Petco that was like 30 or 40% off. Uh, so I bulked up on a little bit of that. And um, Seachem Fluorite is a really affordable planted substrate. It does come super dirty and it's maybe the only substrate you'll need to clean, but drill a few holes at the bottom of a bucket, stick your bucket outside, dump the substrate in, pour some water over it with the hose, and that'll all wash out into your garden. Super easy, you don't even get your hands dirty. None of the other substrates need to be washed out though. Land in aquarium soil is another one that I use fairly often. And then if you wanna look at some high-end stuff, I'd say check out ADA's Amazonia. Uh, you can't go wrong with any ADA products. Root tabs. So eventually your lovely planted aquarium substrate will lose some of its nutrients. And root tabs are a great way to inject nutrients back into the substrate. How long it takes for nutrients to get pulled from your substrate is kind of hard to say. It depends on a few different things. One, what type of plants do you have growing in there? Fast growing plants like stem plants tend to draw a lot of nutrients out of the soil. If you have strong lights that cause your stem plants to grow even faster, that's gonna cause them to pull more. And then whether or not you use liquid fertilizers. Liquid fertilizers supplement the nutrients that plants draw from their roots and help to increase the lifespan of your soil. In general though, I'd say anywhere between six months to a year, or maybe even two years on a very low energy tank, you should consider starting to add root tabs. So this tank, for example, I've had it set up um, you know, with different iterations and layouts and scapes and stuff, but for about three and a half years now, and I've used the same soil. Uh, I've added a little bit to it here and there just to help provide a little slope or gradient towards the back. Um, but I started adding root tabs in about a year in, and I could notice that made a big difference. I do throw in root tabs every six months or so, and that seems to do the job. As far as brands go, pretty much every company that makes fertilizers or planted substrate has some sort of a root tab. I don't think you can go wrong with either of them. Just go with a reputable company. I like to go with Seachem because I know that's a good company, plus they're available to me locally. Liquid fertilizer is great to add in addition to planted substrate. Most plants will actually draw from the roots and the water column. So like I mentioned before, adding that liquid fertilizer will help to increase the lifespan of your planted soil, but it will also just promote healthier plant growth in general. 
Also, if you have epiphytes like Java Fern, Moss, Bucephalandra, or Anubias, you need to have some sort of nutrients in the water column because those plants don't root down in the substrate. What are some things to look for when it comes to liquid fertilizers? Any good liquid fertilizer is going to tell you exactly what's in it. If the brand isn't eager to tell you what's in it, I'd consider that a red flag. Why make a good product and then hide all the best features? As far as the nutrients go that you should be looking for in liquid fertilizer, there's two basic types, macro and micronutrients. The macronutrients are ones that plants need in large quantities. They're usually the building blocks of plants. Like they actually need those nutrients in order to physically grow. Whereas the macro or the micronutrients are often more important when it comes to chemical pathways and regulating internal processes inside the plants. For macronutrients, you should be looking for nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. Oxygen and carbon are also really important for plant growth, but plants get those from water and carbon dioxide, so you don't need to look for those in your fertilizer. As far as micronutrients go, you should be looking for iron, boron, manganese, zinc, copper, and molybdenum. You can buy all-in-one fertilizers, which include everything, or you can buy individual fertilizers and dose each element separately. One of my biggest problems with dosing elements individually is lack of availability of test kits and also lack of personal interest in testing every single one of those elements. So it can take a few weeks to dial in your fertilizing program and I like to test fairly often. Testing each one of those elements for the first few weeks is going to take a crazy amount of time if you can even find all the test kits. I mean, you can find uh, nitrate, phosphate, an iron test kit, but have you ever seen one for molybdenum at your fish store? As far as testing the all-in-one fertilizers, what I like to do is I have an indicator element, which is nitrates. I presume, you know, with any reputable brand, they'll have a well-balanced level of <clears throat> chemicals. So if your nitrates are high, presumably all of your other chemicals are high. If your nitrates are low, then all of your other ones are low. So I test my nitrates and depending on where those are, I assume all the others are at a similar level. So what are some different methods when it comes to using liquid fertilizers? Well, the first one and maybe the easiest one is the estimative index, sometimes just called EI. And the way this works is you provide your plants with more nutrients than they need. Gradually over the week, those nutrient loads build and build and build and then you do a massive water change, 50-60% every week to reset your levels. Uh, now this kind of fertilizing method is great for tanks with uh, tons of fast growing plants, but it can be bad for fish that are sensitive to nitrates. The other downside to using this approach is if you're trying to draw reds out in your plants, most of those red colors are only prominent when your nitrates are low. So it's gonna be hard to pull that off with the estimative index. The next method of fertilizing is called lean dosing. And basically what that is, is you just provide the plants with what they need. This is what uh, people with really sensitive fish or people who are really trying to pull all those reds out in their plants are using. So the way this works is you can either test every chemical like I mentioned earlier, or you can use an indicator chemical like nitrates. Test your nitrates and when those are high, you reduce your fertilizers when they're low, you increase your fertilizers. Now the downside to lean fertilizing is that if you cut it too lean, your plants might not reflect that immediately, but what will happen is their leaves will start to get holes in them and they'll start to turn brown, discolored, and once those leaves are ruined, they're never going to be fixed. So for a stem plant, they can quickly grow new leaves and bounce back, but for some of your slower growing plants like Bucephalandra, or Anubias, it can take a long time to regrow a colony, you know, like a, like a big colony that's been growing for years. Some of these, like this one over here, has taken some damage and it takes a long time and I kick myself for making mistakes like that. So really, in my opinion, the best way is to pick a kind of middle of the road approach, you know, 
Uh, don't provide the plants with such a lean fertilizing method that you're on, you're on the balance of, you know, any less and they're going to start starving. But also don't give them so much that you're worried about, oh, are my fish going to be healthy? And, you know, what happens if I don't do a water change for nine days instead of seven days, you know? Middle of the road approach generally works for everything in life, works for the aquarium too. So in terms of scheduling your fertilizers, I think that little doses every day is the best way to go. On the back of your fertilizer bottle, it'll often tell you to dose once or twice a week. I would just figure out what your tank needs in total for a week, divide that by seven, and then give that amount every day. So uh, plants are actually a lot better at uptaking nutrients and algae. So if you give them little amounts every day, your plants will outcompete algae for nutrients. But if you give them a huge dose once or twice a week, you're gonna have all those extra nutrients in there that algae can utilize. Uh, and the other downside to doing the once or twice a week large doses is that sometimes by the end of that, there really isn't much left in the water column and it's kind of feast or famine for the plants. And um, it's best to just consistently provide them with what they need rather than having them go through brief starvation periods. And the easiest way to stay on top of fertilizing them consistently is to get an auto doser. Uh, I was kind of hesitant at first because I'm like, you know, kind of stingy and thought, oh, you know, I know how to pump stuff in there. I, I won't, I don't need an auto doser. But really what ended up happening is I wasn't home the same time every day. And even on days where I was home, sometimes I'd forget or, uh, you know, I used to travel a lot for my old job and I'd have to ask my partner to do it. And I really didn't want to have to ask her to do that when I was already having a hard time staying on top of it myself. So absolutely no regrets. The auto doser was not that expensive. It was easy to set up and it's made my life so much easier, not to mention I'm more successful with keeping my plants healthy. As far as brands go, I am actually a lot more particular when it comes to brands regarding liquid fertilizer uh, compared to, you know, planted substrate or root tabs. And that's because the liquid fertilizers uh, come in different ratios with respect to nitrogen. So for example, I used to use Nylock G Thrive. That was my first aquarium, uh, you know, liquid fertilizer that I used. And it had really high nitrogen content. Compared to the two hour Aquarius fertilizer that I'm using now, Nylock G had roughly 3%, whereas the two hour Aquarius had 0.6% nitrates or nitrogen. So remember before how I said my monitoring system isn't perfect? Well, this is where it comes into play. So you almost need to get a feel for each fertilizer you're using and understand how well your plants are doing. And that's kind of a visual thing that you get a feel for with time. But in general, if you have a tank that's full of stem plants, go with a heavier nitrogen like Nylock G's Thrive. If you're doing a lot more slow growing plants or a lower light level, then go with something like Two Hour Aquarist. I ended up going with Two Hour Aquarist's uh, you know, all-in-one comprehensive because I wanted lower nitrogen levels. Uh, I think it's better for my fish. I think this fertilizer is more balanced personally, and it also draws more reds out of my plants, which makes me happy. Dry ferts. To be honest, I have absolutely no experience with dry ferts. People like dry fertilizers because they're cheaper than liquid. Um, I've never gone down that path because I don't actually spend that much on my liquid fertilizers. If you have a huge tank, or maybe if you own a fish store and you're just spending a ton of money, then look into dry ferts. And basically the way that works is uh, they come in salts or powders and then you mix them with water and you end up with a liquid fertilizer. There's definitely a strong learning curve associated with using dry ferts, not only when it comes to mixing them, but they come in individual elements or chemicals. Uh, they're not an all-in-one fertilizer, so you're gonna also need to master the art of figuring out how much of each one to put in. And as you know, like I talked about earlier, 
I'm a strong fan of the all-in-one fertilizers. And the last major way you can get nutrients in your water column is through fish waste. Fish poo has some good elements in it like nitrogen, phosphates, phosphorus, and calcium. Not to mention fish excrete ammonia from their gills, and if your tank's cycled, that'll get converted to nitrates. If you're in a really fish-heavy aquarium, like with some big old South American cichlids, you know, you might want to skip out on a nitrogen-heavy fertilizer, maybe even go with a zero nitrate fertilizer. I'll link that in the description if you're interested. There's really no need to double down on nitrates for, for fish-heavy aquariums, but if you're really serious about getting the most out of your plants, which you probably are if you made it this far in the video, then make sure you add in some micronutrients at the very least. Striking a balance between all the different nutrients in your tank can be hard. Like I mentioned before, if you're using individual fertilizers for each chemical, then you should be testing those. If you're using an all-in-one, then maybe just get an indicator element and test that. For new tanks, I like to start really slow. Like, I don't even use liquid fertilizer for the first week, and then the next few weeks, I really ease into it. Sometimes I just use a zero nitrate fertilizer until the tank is cycled and the plants have filled in, and then I start easing in with nitrates. The other important thing to think about is how to change your dosing schedule as your tank grows and as you make changes on that tank. So I just talked about adding more nutrients to your tank as your plants get bigger and healthier and uptake more, but what happens if you, let's say, remove all of your stem plants and put in a few ferns? Your nutrient uptake is gonna drop drastically and if you don't reduce the amount of nutrients you're adding to that tank, that could be harmful for your fish. Other things to think about that could change the nutrient uptake rate are, you know, changing your lights. If you're adding a really strong light or reducing the intensity of your strong light, that's something to consider. Adding CO2 or taking CO2 away, that's gonna affect the uptake rate. Another really important thing to consider is chemical filtration. Removing nitrate pads or adding nitrate pads is really gonna alter your water parameters. So think about all these things, how your tank grows and matures, and how the changes you make to your tank will affect the water quality, and how you should reflect your fertilizing schedule to make sure that your plants and livestock stay healthy. Well, that's it for today. Not exactly the most warm and fuzzy topic, uh, thanks a lot for watching this video. As usual, drop me a comment if you got a question, and subscribe if you've enjoyed today's content. Thanks a lot. See ya!